This video will discuss the Born-Oppenheimer approximation specifically applied to the H2 molecule. So we start with our hydrogen molecule model. We have two nuclei, uh, nucleus A and nucleus B. Each of them has a charge of plus one proton, and they have a mass which is equal to the mass of a proton. We have two electrons of charge minus E and mass Me. So we have six pairs of charged particles that interact through the Coulomb potential and their distances being R1a, R1b, R2a, R2b. So different distances from electrons to nuclei that attract each other. R12, electrons distance repelling each other. And Rab, the distance which the nuclei are at which repel one another. So in principle, our Schrodinger equation is a, is a function of all 12 of these Cartesian coordinates, three coordinates of electron one, three coordinates of electron two, x, y, and z of nucleus A, x, y, and z of nucleus B. So our wave function is a 12-dimensional wave function, and our Schrodinger equation being h psi equals e psi, as always. So the first thing we're gonna do to deal with our very long Hamiltonian for now, is to say that the mass of the nuclei is much, much greater than the mass of the electrons. So the one proton weighs about 1800 times more than a single electron, and most nuclei are even heavier than hydrogen nuclei. So a carbon nucleus is 20,000 times heavier than an electron. So what we do is we assume that since the mass of the nuclei is such so much greater than the mass of the electrons that the nuclei are fixed or the kinetic energy of the nuclei are zero. We're going to solve for the wave functions of the electrons at a fixed position of the nuclei. So now our wave function as a function of these 12 dimensional coordinates is equal to a wave function of the electrons so a six dimensional wave function, wave function of the two uh, of the XYZ coordinates of each electron. And then it depends only parametrically on the position of nucleus A and nucleus B. So nucleus A and nucleus B, their positions are input as a parameter to this wave function, but psi R1, R2 is not actually, they're not variables in that wave function. So that's our electronic wave function, which we then multiply by our nuclear wave function which is a wave function as a position of, of Ra and Rb. So electronic times nuclear wave function gives our total 12-dimensional wave function. So what we're typically solving in molecular quantum mechanics is actually the electronic Schrodinger equation. Our electronic Hamiltonian acting on our electronic wave function equals our electronic energy times our electronic wave function. So our electronic energy is a function of those input parameters, which are the locations of each nucleus. So what we get by solving the electronic Schrodinger equation is actually the potential energy as a function of these two nuclei. It is actually a potential energy surface of the coordinates of the nuclei. So anytime you've heard of a potential energy surface for molecules, that actually comes from solving the electronic Schrodinger equation at a variety of different nuclear coordinates. All right, so we have our total Hamiltonian here, which I've already marked up, which we'll read through on the first try. Kinetic energy of nucleus A, kinetic energy of nucleus B, kinetic energy of electron one, kinetic energy of electron two, attraction of electron one to nucleus A, attraction of electron one to nucleus B, attraction of electron two to nucleus A, attraction of electron two to nucleus B, repulsion of each electron to each other, and repulsion of the nuclei. So what has now changed given the Born-Oppenheimer approximation? Well, we said the kinetic energy of our nuclei is zero. Our nuclei don't move, so their second derivatives with respect to their position is zero. So these nuclear kinetic energy terms go away. Now our kinetic energy and our attraction to the nuclei is much more solvable because these are just solving uh, relative to constant things, things that can be separated into functions of variables of just one electron. 
um, the, the nuclear repulsion term just becomes algebra because at a fixed distance, ZA times ZB over RAB is, are all just, are all just, you know, are just real numbers. So this becomes an algebraic term. The thing that is still the stick in the mud for molecular quantum mechanics is the repulsion between electrons. This depends on the, on the coordinates of two electrons simultaneously, whereas all these other terms depend on the coordinates of either electron one or the coordinates of electron two. This depends on both and we cannot separate it, so we can't do separation of variables and this is the reason why we have to work so hard to get other methods to solve for the energies of our molecules, just as we did for atoms with more than one electron. All right, so now in atomic units, our electronic Hamiltonian is equal to minus one half del square, minus one half del squared one, minus ZA over R1A, minus ZB over R1B. So that's the terms for electron one kinetic energy attraction to each nucleus, minus one half del squared two, minus ZA over R2A, minus ZB over R2B, all terms that depend on electron two, its kinetic energy and attraction to each nucleus, plus the repulsion of the electrons, one over R12, and then we can include this ZA, ZB over RAB, which will just be a constant, which will just add some constant to the electronic energy. All right, and we could have a nuclear Hamiltonian and a nu for our nuclear wave function and a nuclear Schrodinger equation as well. The nuclear Hamiltonian acting on the nuclear wave function equals the nuclear energy times the nuclear wave function. And our nuclear Hamiltonian would be the kinetic energy operator of nucleus A plus the kinetic energy operator of nucleus B plus the electronic potential energy at the coordinates of electron of nucleus A and nucleus B. So if we've solved for the electronic energy at all coordinates of nucleus A and nucleus B, that can be fed in as a potential energy function to our nuclear Schrodinger equation. And in fact, this potential energy surface from the electronic, uh, from the electronic Schrodinger equation is what gives us the ideas for what these potential energy functions should be, for example, in the harmonic oscillator. We saw our electronic potential energy surface, which we approximated then as a parabola, giving us, giving us uh, the potential energy function we used to solve for what is effectively the motion of, of nuclei in the harmonic oscillator system. So things are starting to come full circle now that we're seeing where we're getting that potential energy surface for our, for our nuclei to vibrate coming from solving the electronic Schrodinger equation at every different configuration of, of our positions of our nuclei.